All right, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome. I see some people are still joining in, so we will do a slow start as always. Um, welcome, welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to this online DDMA lecture with uh, today, Dr. Imperial Bode. My name is Bernice Boutin, and I'm project leader of the DDMA project, uh, which is on designing international law and ethics into military applications of artificial intelligence. Uh, the project is carried out here at the Acer Institute in The Hague, and it explores the implication of the increasing use of AI in the military domain with a focus on legal, ethical, and technical approaches. Uh, we look in particular how, at how technology can affect human agency and how to respond to these challenges from a multidisciplinary perspective. I invite you to visit our website, uh, acer.nl slash dilemma, to read more about the project and our activities. Uh, and as part of this project, we launched last year a lecture series, and today we are very glad to welcome Dr. Inbjörn Bode. I look forward to hearing uh, your insightful perspectives on the topic of human control in the context of military AI. And for now, we'd like to hand over the floor to our moderator of today, Claudia Klonowska, who is a PhD researcher with the uh, Dilemma Project. Thank you very much, Berenice, for this kind introduction. Um, and right now we're gonna move into the introduction of our speaker. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, so today we have the pleasure to welcome Dr. Ingrid Bolle, who is gonna give a lecture on the topic of which practices shape norms and retaining human control over the use of force. As you may have seen, Dr. Ingrid Bolle is Associate Professor at the Center for War Studies at the University of Southern Denmark. She's the principal investigator of the European Research Council founded project Auto norms, weaponized artificial intelligence norms, and order. And the Auto Norm project, uh, Auto Norms project, investigates how practices related to autonomous weapon systems change international norms, especially in relation to the use of force. Auto, uh, Auto Norms uh, investigates military, transnational, political, and dual use practices in several case studies, and th those are China, Japan, Russia, and the US. Uh, more on the personal note, Dr. Ingvild's research specifically focuses on analyzing processes of policy and normative change in the area of peace and security, especially in relation to weaponized AI, the use of force, and United Nations peacekeeping. Uh, and I'd also like to draw your attention to Ingvild's uh, upcoming book titled Autonom Autonomous Weapons and International Norms that will uh, come out sometime in early 2022. And previously, Ingvild was senior lecturer in international relations at the University of Kent, and the postdoc research with a Japan Society for the Promotion of Science at the United Nations University and the University of Tokyo. Um, now, just a small practical note for our uh, lecture today. You're all welcome to send in your questions for the Q&A session through the uh, Zoom chat function. I'll be collecting those for you during the, during the lecture, and then we will be asking them at the end collectively um, in, in the last 20 minutes. Uh, and right now we will give the floor to Dr. Bode. Um, you're, you're welcome to share your screen um, and uh, we're looking forward to your lecture. Thank you so much, uh, Claudia, for this kind of introduction and uh, for inviting me, of course. Thank you to the Dela and my team for organizing this. Um, I can't actually share my screen. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. So um, one second, we'll make that available for you. Thank you. I'm losing valuable minutes here. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm sorry about the technical yeah. hiccups. No worries. I think there has never been a, um, <laughs> an event about AI, you know, that hasn't involved some some, <laughs> some technical issues. So that's absolutely fine. We can um, see it. Yeah. Okay, great. So yeah, thank you again for inviting me to present um, as part of the Dilemma lecture series, and thank you for your kind introduction. 
Um, so it gives me great pleasure to share some of my um, ongoing research with you. So as you see, the, the kind of the paper or uh, the research I'm talking about is entitled Which Practices Shape Norms Retaining Human Control Over the Use of Force? And this is part of ongoing research as part of water norms. So um, my research kind of speaks to an empirical puzzle in the field of weaponized AI, specifically so-called uh, lethal autonomous weapon systems or laws. So laws are systems that once activated can select and engage targets without further human intervention. So what is at stake here is uh, basically the extent to which humans remain in meaningful control over the use of force. So this topic has been discussed at the UN in Geneva over the past um, six, seven years actually, um, and uh, uh, under the convention of third conventional weapons. So also you might hear the term GGE, so group of governmental experts, which have been um, a more formalized debate about this issue. And here the issue of human control has become a key concern and states put forward very different understandings of what this, what this means. Um, from the perspective of international relations or political science, we could therefore study um, human control as an emerging norm. And we could kind of try to track discursively how states understand not human control and what kind of understanding in the end kind of crystallizes out of that and is accepted uh, internationally among a larger group of states. I have attended these meetings in Geneva um, as an academic observer since 2017, and in this time have noticed something uh, curious about the debate, which is that it characterizes laws as a problem of the future. So states often refer to uh, the discussion around human control as a preemptive form of norm setting and a response to development that would be deeply problematic if not regulated in time. But this framing uh, does not acknowledge that uh, states already use a number of weapon systems with automated and autonomous features and targeting. And some of these weapons have been in use for decades. So this basic observation uh, leads me to my research question, which practices shape the emerging norm of meaningful human control? And I argue to make sense of the shape of, that, of this norm, we need to um, take two processes of norm emergence into account. And I, I kind of classify them in my research as, as primarily verbal and nonverbal in nature. So we have on the one hand a deliberative verbal process that shapes the emerging norm of human control through discursive or verbal practices that happen to a large extent at the UN in Geneva, so this forum of the GGE that I mentioned. And then I think there is a second silent process that has shaped the emerging human control norm by how states perform often nonverbal practices of designing, um, training personnel for and operating weapon systems with autonomous features. And while I think this kind of verbal process of the emergence is quite well mapped and um, scholars have written about this, we actually know very little about the nonverbal process, nor about how the two processes interact in shaping the substance of the emerging human control norm. So my, my research really is, is, is about conceptualizing these two processes of norm emergence and understanding how they, how they interact. And for this, I return to an early constructivist understanding of norms as tacit and nonverbal in nature. Uh, and this understanding of norms has actually become under-researched in scholarship on, um, on norms, which has instead prioritized discursive sources of norms. And I argue that practice theories and in international relations um, can provide a good source of inspiration for an empirical oriented model for studying practices of saying and practices of doing, of doing as sources of um, international norms. Uh, so this is kind of the first step, bringing up this kind of nonverbal dimension to, to norms. And the second step is to conceptualize the processes or the dynamics of interaction between these nonverbal and verbal processes. So, um, so here I, I, I understand the dynamics by way of four different kind of mechanisms uh, that we'll go, to in the next, go, go through in more detail in the next couple of slides. So um, as you can maybe already see from this introduction, my understanding of norms is, is quite broad. So it goes beyond legal norms and takes into account social norms. I define norms as understandings of appropriateness. Um, so that are normative and that also make normal. So what I mean by this is that norms always imply understandings of voteness or of justice, but they also make normal over the performance of many similar practices and over time. I, I go on um, in, in the context of this, of this presentation to empirically study the two processes of norm emergence, starting with the nonverbal process. And for this, I use the case of air defense systems as a type of weapon system with autonomous or automated features, because um, this, this system is, uh, these systems are quite widely spread. So around uh, 90 states use, um, use um, some form of air defense systems, 
and they have been operational since the 1970s. So we have quite a long trajectory of practices to look back on. And I think why this research is kind of inspired by a specific empirical puzzle, so the puzzle of where does the human control norm come from, I try to formulate uh, insights that are also relevant to, to studying broader processes of norm emergence, especially in the field of arms control and disarmaments. Before I go into some of the more analytical specifics um, of these uh, processes of norm emergence, let me just clarify some of the key terms and understandings I will use throughout the presentation. So, as already mentioned previously, weaponized AI is often associated with so-called autonomous weapon systems. And that's again the definition that I gave you in the introduction. Uh, but I think what's quite important to realize is that this notion of, of laws or laws is a catch-all term. It is not a clearly definable category of weapons, but its usage is very common in the international debate. So to approach weaponized AI, I think it's actually more useful to think about uh, weapon systems with autonomous or automated features. So auto, auto, autonomous or automated features can be integrated into weapon systems in many different ways, including to fulfill mobility functions. But the debate that I am concerned with concentrates really on, on so-called critical or targeting functions. So these relate basically to the selection and engagement of calculated targets. Uh, if you are familiar with the debate about weaponized AI, you will also know that um, there are various definitions of what is actually AI, what is automation, what is autonomy. Uh, so they have been defined in multiple ways, and it's often difficult to assess based on open sources what weapon systems um, uh, that get media coverage are actually technologically capable of. And this is because the actors involved in, in this debate have a political stake in defining the extent to which the systems, such systems are autonomous or automated and may adapt their communication strategy depending on the audience that they are addressing. So some actors may therefore use the term automated or highly automated rather than autonomous, because they imply a higher level of human control. But in practice, the line between kind of what is automated and what is autonomous is, is actually quite, quite hard to, or it's not easily drawn. So I've included some, some basic definitions here just uh, for, for your perusal. But basically, my, um, uh, for me, autonomy or building here on basic robotics definition is, is not, does not mean that a system is, is intelligent um, in the common sense parlance but just means that the system is capable of, once activated, performing some tasks or functions uh, on its own. So this basically means that based on sensor input, the system chooses, uh, um, in inverted commerce, between different ranges of actions that are either pre-programmed or may also be based on machine learning. Uh, and uh, given this background, I think it's quite helpful to think about weapon systems along a spectrum of autonomy. So you would have on the one side uh, remote control systems, such as um, Drones, for example, like the, like the Reaper, in which human agents remain in manual control of targeting functions. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you would have fully autonomous systems where humans would be no longer involved in specific use of force decisions that are instead um, administered by the system itself, which operates completely on its own. And then in the middle, you have these kind of complex human machine interaction where you actually have a, um, a system that includes various automated or autonomous features. Um, and I think most of the systems that we, we are seeing and we like it to see kind of exist in this middle side of the spectrum when we think about autonomy. So then let me also just talk briefly about, about my understanding of human control. Um, so human control was introduced by an NGO called Article 36 um, to actually get out of the, the kind of deadlock um, at the UN debate about how to define autonomy and how to define laws. But actually, what ended up happening is that it just um, introduced another term that, uh, that now is in dispute and, um, and states are um, have very different uh, thoughts on how to define it. Uh, but it's also gained, gained quite a lot of traction. Um, and you see maybe it gave slightly different wordings of this, of this topic. Over time, um, various stakeholders in the debate have also tried to refine our understanding of what this actually means. So what do we mean by meaningful human control? Uh, and um, um, I think last year, both uh, CIPRI and the ICIC, but also the uh, Campaign to Stop Killer Robots published kind of their kind of operationalizations of human control, if you, if you will. So they talked about uh, human control having three different dimensions. First of all, the technological dimension that basically um, says, okay, humans may be able to exercise control over weapons through exercising um, control over the design of weapon parameters. For example, limits on the target type, um, the predictability of the system and fail-safe mechanisms. Then there's a situational or conditional dimension 
where humans might set operational limits to how weapon systems can be used in order to enhance human control. So these might be, for example, restrictions on where and when the system can be used and the duration of the operation. And then there's a decision-making dimension, which defines acceptable forms or qualities of human-machine interaction through ensuring appropriate levels of human supervision in specific, tar specific targeting situations. And this is kind of the element that this particular piece of research of mine focuses on, so this decision-making element. Um, I just want to highlight, of course, this is not the only element that matters, but it's just something that, that we focus, or I focus on in the context of, of this specific paper. And you see here that this decision-making element, again, has been typically um, captured by, by this loop imagery, uh, where you basically have the idea of a human in the loop, so uh, which is the idea that um, humans have, the, um, have to authorize the release of weapons and manage the engagement process. So basically, before, before the system can initiate an attack, the human always um, has to be involved in some shape or form. Then there's the, the kind of human on the loop systems, where the, the human still plays a role, but its role is kind of reduced. So this might be in the form of having a time-restricted veto that the human operator can exercise before a force is released. And then finally, you would have humans out of the loop systems where the, where the system is completely engaging in this decision-making on its own and the human kind of is outside of that, um, of, that, um, of that spectrum. So following this basic engagement with uh, some key terms, let me return to my analytical arguments. Um, oops, sorry. Here we go. So this is a visualization of the two processes of non-emergence that I mentioned in my introduction. So, so we basically have kind of a silent process and a verbal process of non-emergence. The verbal process essentially started when the issue of laws entered the international community's agenda, which was first at the Human Rights Council um, in the early 2010s, and then uh, later since 2014, at the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons. So since then, as the figure shows, the two processes more or less run parallel to each other, but the silent operational process precedes the verbal process. And that for me is analytically quite significant because it means that whatever kind of is, is verbalized or discussed in the verbal process is shaped by the practices of how weapon systems with autonomous features have been designed and have been used in the decades preceding uh, this, this um, debate. And I would say this kind of observation is quite typical for the field of arms control because states often develop and use weapons integrating novel technologies years or even decades before uh, there is an international debate about their appropriateness. In the absence of such a debate, nonverbal practices associated with designing, training personnel for and using such weapons shape norms that determine their appropriateness and often tacitly. So that means that they're not really, they're not really spoken, they're not really um, articulated in, in any shape or form. So of course, this process of tacit shaping does not happen in a normative vacuum, just to highlight that. So states perform these nonverbal practices in the context of a dense normative structure that sets certain boundaries for how they can design and use novel weapons, so such as IHL. So there is a certain baseline from which to assess or determine appropriate conduct, but, um, um, international law is not, not only ambiguous, as critical legal scholarship has demonstrated, but it may also be contradictory, uh, therefore leading to different assessments of what constitutes appropriate action. So this means there's actually considerable wiggle room for states performing nonverbal and verbal practices in relation to novel weapon systems. Now to, to come to the specific dynamics of interaction identified between the two processes of norm emergent. And this is kind of this is interesting because I think these dynamics shape the eventual um, shape of the, of, of the norm, of the human control norm in my case. So once a uh, public debate has started, we, we see these processes of or dynamics of, of interaction. And I think there are at least four different dynamics, uh, negative and positive acknowledgement, collision and ignorance. So uh, first, I differentiate between positive and negative ways in, uh, in which the verbal process of home emergence may acknowledge the nonverbal process. In the case of negative acknowledgement, states and other stakeholders um, point out the adverse consequences of the silent process of non-emergence. So cases for this are, for example, the 1997 Ottawa Treaty that banned anti-personal landmines or the 1992 Chemical Weapons Convention. So here, while the creation of new international legal norms has not completely ended the initial practices, their public deliberation and verbalization has have changed them significantly. 
In the case of anti-personal landmines, for example, to the effect that most states ceased their use, production and trade after the Ottawa Treaty in the 1990s. Um, by contrast, interaction with, uh, by a positive acknowledgement sees a positive affirmation of existing nonverbal practices as they become verbalized. So I argue that this is partly what we see in the case of human control, although the, the, of course here in, the case, uh, in this case, deliberative process um, of non-emergence is still ongoing. So, so far states parties uh, to the CCW have only agreed on very broadly phrased um, requirements of human control. Mm. Well, um, and, and actually, um, I would say that the dominant mode of interaction is more or less ignorance, but you also see some positive acknowledgement. I will talk about this um, in the case of human control in a bit. In, in a bit. So in the case of positive um, affirmation or acknowledgement, practices performed by states are not likely to change. It may even intensify because of an interaction between the processes of non-emergence. Then we also might have um, a dynamic of, of collision where contradictory practices continue to coexist despite nonverbal practices that preceded public deliberation having been verbalized and discussed. I think this is what we see in the case of nuclear weapons. Mm. On the one hand, practices of designing and using nuclear weapons have led uh, to a process of deliberative non-emergence in the form of the 1970 NPT and the 2021 Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And to some extent, these, uh, to some extent, these processes have, con have kind of reshaped the norm and existing practices. But at the same time, states still possess and pursue nuclear weapons and consider such practices as appropriate, um, as, for example, the wide abstention to the um, Prohibition Treaty demonstrates. And then finally, the last dynamic is this um, uh, dynamic of ignorance that describes an interaction where the deliberative process of non-emergence does not explicitly acknowledge the silent process or de facto and perhaps willfully ignores it, including by, by engaging in distancing. So this is another dynamic we can see at play in the case of laws. So here also we should not expect nonverbal practices uh, to change as they have not been publicly discussed or um, scrutinized. So let me now go into more the empirics of the case and to illustrate how these kind of analytical reflections might play out in practice. Just to tell you a little bit of um, about what this what this analysis is based on, so um, so I basically analyzed the two processes of non-emergence with four different qualitative methods. So these include um, participant observation at the GGE meetings in the last uh, four years, uh, expert interviews, and then also um, together with my colleague Tom Watts, we compiled a qualitative data catalog of twenty eight air defense systems and specifically looked at how how such systems, um, what basically their te technical capabilities are. So to what extent are they autonomous or automated and how does human control figure in their configuration? And then we also analyzed um, four high profile failures of air defense systems. So these are kind of instances where civilian airliners uh, were brought down by air defense systems in mistaken um, on, yeah, and failures of identification basically, and also a case of, um, of friendly fire in the, in the context of the um, 2003 Iraq war. Um, so we'll now go through the key findings, uh, looking at these um, two processes of non-emergence, starting with the non-verbal process. So here my, uh, my, my key finding is that um, uh, basically non-verbal practices of design, training personnel from operating air defense systems have fundamentally changed the role of human operators. So the fundamental change um, rests in the, in the fact that human operators have um, the role of human operators has become minimized, but also making it increasingly complex. Uh, and, and therefore, I think as a result, human machine interaction or human control and specific use of force situations has incrementally become meaningless rather than meaningful. And I will now go through the three types of practices that I look at in reaching this conclusion. So practices of design, training, and of operation. In terms of practices of design, introducing automated or autonomous features has significantly increased the complexity of the system's inner workings. And this creates significant barriers for understanding the system's decision-making from the design stage onwards. For, so for example, the US Patriot air defense system runs on more than 3.5 million lines of software code and is designed to be operated in a network cooperation 
with other even more complex eddy fence systems. So from the get-go, this means that being able to comprehend the system puts a significant knowledge burden on the human operator that is bound to contribute to them misperceiving or misunderstanding the system's behavior. Further important practices of design relate to how our defense systems make targeting decisions via target profiles um, and how they make target assessments. So practices show uh, how systems classify targets via typically wide rather than narrow target profiles. And this is what this uh, figure um, on, the, on the left hand um, um, demonstrates. Such profiles may be based on weight, heat shape, acoustic signature, or radar signature. Defining a wide target profile reduces the risk of false negatives, that is, failures to recognize a potential target because it doesn't align precisely enough with the target profile. But this means that civilian aircraft can fall within the target profile of an air defense system, and it becomes the task of the human operator to make a determination in specific use of force situations. So this basically necessitates human triangulation and was highlighted in the context of the tragic downing of Ukraine Airlines flight PS752 um, um, by the Iranian Tor M1 system in January 2020. So here, one expert of, of the system is quoted uh, with saying, everything becomes an enemy to the missile unless you can identify by sight and turn a missile off. Uh, but the, so on the one hand, human triangulation is required in a way, but uh, the extent to which this can be meaningful is also compromised by the complexity of the system and also by further practices uh, surrounding it. Uh, and this brings me to practices of training. So here, training regimes for, um, for operators of a defense systems appear to conform to common myth uh, associated with uh, autonomous weapon systems, autonomous systems in general. So one of these myths is that um, increasing autonomous features decreases the need for human machine interaction and makes the work of the human operator easier. In fact, the reverse is true. So, um, but, but this is actually not reflected in, in training reality. So there's a mismatch between the training practices in preparing personnel for operating complex air defense systems in stressful combat situations and uh, what is actually required. Uh, studies have found that the experience level of individual operators and crews of, for example, the Patriot system has been reduced since integrating automated and autonomous features into the system itself. So, and training is also inadequately designed in light of problems of overtrust or what you might also know as automation bias or automation complacency. So this is the tendency to over rely on automation and accept the outputs provided by um, autonomous systems uncritically. And it can manifest in a psychological state characterized by a low level of suspicion. In training exercises for the Patriot system, again, the operating protocol was largely automatic and the operators were trained to trust the system software. This then manifests in putting greater score on the veracity of a system's output rather than on their own critical ability to deliberate and triangulate. So training practices should therefore enable human operators to step in where the system fails in other words, pro, um, human operators would need a productive balancing of trust and distrust to know when to trust the system and when to question its outputs. So this is a case of human judgment, which operators have to get exactly right. And as already dis discussed, both too much and too little trust in the system can create problems. But current training practices do not foster this outcome and have not been adapted even after high profile failures associated with air defense systems. Finally, coming to practices of operation. Here, practices of design. Um, I mean, first of all, it's, I think it's important to realize that the, the, the practices I mentioned, the practice of design and of training, already structure human machine interaction in ways that severely limits what kind of practices human personnel can perform in operating the systems. But there are also some particular practice of operation I want to add. So, first of all, um, in uh, integrating more autonomous features into air defense systems, there's been a role change for human operators, which has been quite drastic. So from being an active controller, they have now become passive supervisors. Um, and um, this, this kind of role change um, resulted from not only delegating motor or sensory tasks to the system, but also crucially cognitive tasks or cognitive skills. So human operators um, are often left without anything useful to do until they are called upon to act. So they find themselves in kind of situations of underload or of uh, overload. So for the long hours of monitoring the system, human operators are underloaded with uh, tasks as the system is doing its work. And then, um, then they have to switch 
in, into high pressure combat situations very quickly, where they might be overloaded by tasks of triangulating objects that the system identified as targets and deliberating whether to release force or not. While it's unclear how they are supposed to make this switch, when they often lack a functional understanding of the system's targeting process, and they also lack the time to regain situational awareness. So I think the, the, the basic result of, um, of these practices is that, um, is that they shape an emerging norm of what counts as meaningful human control in specific targeting situations. And that norm is that humans have a diminished, reduced role in use of force decisions, and that this diminished uh, decision-making capacity is somehow appropriate or normal. The next slide will now track the interaction of this nonverbal process with deliberations about human control in the context of the laws debate. In this case, it come back, comes back to the dynamics of interaction I mentioned earlier on. So I identify three dynamics of interaction between verbal and nonverbal processes of non emergence in the case of human control. The first is willful ignorance or silence. So here, um, and this is actually what, what, what I think we observe most often, is that the debate on laws just completely ignores the fact that there are existing weapon systems with autonomous automated features, or tries to kind of define the problem away and kind of saying that these are not actually um, laws, they are either, either semi-autonomous or they don't fall therefore into the purview of the debate. So to a large extent, the debate remains silent about these um, historical um, and currently existing types of system. Then we also have uh, a an, an dynamic of, intera of uh, interaction that is um, kind of distancing. So here laws are kind of conceived as a future problem. States highlight that laws do not exist yet um, and um, in many different ways. Uh, and, and that what the GGE does is an exercise of preemptive norm making. So you, you often find that states talk about potential laws or future laws or things that do not, that do not exist yet. And this has become something of a mantra almost. And what this does is also, of course, distancing um, what is talked about in uh, the debate in Geneva from what states have been, have been doing for the past decades. Uh, and then you also have some instances of positive acknowledgement. So in the few instances that existing weapon systems are mentioned, they argue to be operated under meaningful human control. So air defense systems in particular have been framed as something of the gold standard of meaningful human control because they have a human operator in the loop or on the loop. So for example, the Netherlands or the US have expressed these sentiments. And these arguments shelf a discussion of eye defense systems as they supposedly already fulfill the requirements of the emerging human control norm. Uh, this means that the prevailing understanding among states parties to the CCW is that the only thing that may be gained from studying existing systems with autonomous features uh, best practices for how meaningful human control can be successfully exercised. What does this all mean for the emerging human control norm? Fundamentally, I think such practices undercut international efforts to potentially regulate laws through codifying a positive obligation towards meaningful human control. Current verbal practices do not scrutinize the human control norm that emerges from practices performed in relation to existing systems such as air defense systems. Further, by distancing existing weapons from the debate on future laws, such practices act to legitimize existing systems because they are not laws. More so, some states, parties, and other stakeholders also positively acknowledge current practices of using weapons with autonomous features as representing meaningful human control. But what is positively acknowledged here is not a high quality of direct human control in specific use of force situations. In fact, I think studying uh, the air defense systems case in a lot of detail shows that even direct human control, so either in the loop or on the loop control, does not automatically make human control meaningful because of the complexity of human machine interaction. And I think this is not a surprise as research in human factor analysis has demonstrated these issues for years. It is just a surprise that these research findings have virtually no platform in the debate uh, on laws. Um, let me conclude. Um, so, in response to an empirical puzzle about where does the human emerging human control norm come from, I proposed examining norm emergent via two simultaneously performed um, processes that I capture as verbal and nonverbal processes of norm emergence. And I think that looking at existing weapon systems is a good way to ground the debate about so-called laws in the present and show how such weapons are already shaping what states consider as appropriate when it comes to using force. 
So there are more types of weapon systems that I uh, want to go through in the course of my research. Uh, as, um, as you see in this current work only focuses on our defense systems, but we're also looking at other types such as loyalty munitions. Just to see to what extent um, the understanding of the in the, emerging in the context of using these weapon systems correspond to what we've seen um, in the case of air defense systems. And I think this, um, as, as any good research um, um, paper, this also raises maybe more questions than it answers. So <laughs> I just leave you with three active research questions that, that um, we, are, we are pondering. One is the, the role of technologies. So what role actually do technologies play in the performance of these nonverbal practices and consequently in shaping norms? Um, I think it's quite clear that the emerging human control norm has not only been shaped by human designers, human commanders, and human operators in isolation, but in close enmeshment with technologies. And there's much, I think, intellectual space to explore these questions further through having conversations at, um, across other disciplines, for example, to uh, connecting to science and technology studies. Um, and there are some studies that are exploring this, or this already, but I think there's a lot of uh, room there still for, for interdisciplinary dialogue. Um, I think what is, what is important here is that acknowledging te technologies does not only uh, expand the modes that are relevant for studying emerging norms, so verbal and nonverbal um, norms, um, norm immersion processes, uh, but also the sites of norm research by highlighting spaces and practices that are often invisible to scholars and practitioners. The second active research question is the question of agency. So where is actually the agency in these processes of norm emergence, especially when considering, considering these non-verbal practices, which are the much longer um, process compared to the verbal um, process. Uh, so focusing on the role of technologies may, may lead researchers to vest agency in such objects. So suddenly the technology becomes the agent. But I think what I really rather want to highlight um, is, is that a human agency becomes dispersed, but very much present in these processes. So technologies do not naturally become important reference points by themselves, but because of processes of social meaning making, they are carriers of practices, often not necessarily in intended ways. Thinking about agency also raises the question of who benefits from silent processes of non-emergence being performed at sites that are typically invisible to a critical public. Uh, and I think um, that states using uh, these weapons clearly benefit from such in invisible and accessible processes because they have more room of maneuver. And at the same time, the kind of pressure that complex human machine interaction puts military personnel under is not necessarily in the interests of those states. So however, it's, it currently seems to be often taken as an unavoidable risk in the grand scheme of things. And then third, what do these processes mean for international law and the use of force? Um, so as I said, my focus um, really goes beyond capturing legal norms to, uh, to, um, to also understand social norms, but, but ultimately I'm also interested in how all of this interrelates with, uh, with the process of international law or international law formation. And I think um, the way I see it at the moment, there are two potential scenarios. So for, uh, either these kind of nonverbal processes over time may come to change how certain core provisions of international law are understood, or the second scenario, they may continue to run in parallel to legal standards. So we might even have, um, for example, if, if states parties ever agree to move towards negotiating um, a legal uh, regulation on laws, we might see a positive obligation to human control codified in, in either soft or hard law. But um, seeing that uh, at the moment, uh, the debate actually does not scrutinize really the specifics of the human control conundrum, we might still see a coexistence of these normal verbal practices with this um, soft or hard law, whatever sh shape it might take. So in this second, in this scenario, I think we would risk that the, the law would kind of remain intact or would actually um, regulate, but would be de facto undercut and therefore might lose an importance giving these, uh, these nonverbal practices that remain essentially ungoverned. All right, I, I stop it on, on this positive note um, and um, just want to draw your attention to, to the work of the Autonomous Project. So we have a, a website that, um, continuously updates uh, on our current research process and also includes a number of blog posts where you just can kind of share ongoing reflections. And I really look forward to, to your questions now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ingvild, for your insightful presentation. Um, I will...